Welcome to our Palm Sunday service of worship at First Baptist Church in Beverly. This is obviously a different kind of Palm Sunday for us as we are together in this wilderness moment, uh, this different kind of Lent where we are navigating some new and uncertain times and we're not able to be together physically in our worship space and yet here we are able to be together and joined together in our hearts and joined together in this time of worship. And so welcome. We are so glad to have you here with us worshiping uh, virtually through the internet, but also joining together our hearts and our minds as we do so on this Palm Sunday morning. So welcome, and we hope that you find joy and hope, comfort and solace in the moments of this service. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to invite all the children of the church to come forward for the step sitters and all the children who are watching us all around to know that this step sitters story time is for you. So this is a virtual step sitters. I wish we could all be together on the steps of the church and share a story together. But in the meantime, until that time happens, I want to share a story with you now. It's about Palm Sunday and Palm Sunday is a day of great joy. That was the day when Jesus and his disciples entered the city of Jerusalem. And people were so excited. They took palm branches and they threw them on the ground and they waved them in the air and they took their coats off and they threw them down on the dusty ground as Jesus came in upon a donkey which walked over the coats and over the palms and the people shouted. They were full of joy because Jesus was with them. What gives you joy? What makes you happy? What makes you want to dance around? I wish I could hear your answers right now, but I know that there's so much joy in the world and there's so much to be grateful for, isn't there? I want to tell you about a few things that give me joy, that make me happy. You see those pink tulips? I love flowers. And so I picked those flowers and I brought them home and gave them to Trisha because I wanted to give her joy and I wanted her to know how much I love her. How do you show love and gratitude and joy to those in your house who are part of your life? And now also over my shoulder is a, a photo which makes me smile, which gives me great joy. It's the photo of a friend of mine named Jennifer. 
And I met Jennifer when she was about three years old. And she was having breakfast on her front steps of her home in the village of La Pimienta in Nicaragua. And I asked her and her mom if I could take Jennifer's photo and they said yes. And I've kept this photo for many years because it makes me smile. Jennifer is now about 18 years old and she has grown up in that village healthy and happy. And that's because a ministry which First Baptist Church in Beverly is a part of called Amos Health and Hope provides health care for boys and girls, little girls like Jennifer, so that they can grow up healthy. And it makes me smile to look at her then and to know that she's well now. And that's a lot about what it, what it means to be part of First Baptist Church. We're all about supporting each other, helping each other, whether it's people right here in Beverly in the North Shore or far away in a country like Nicaragua. We are filled with joy because God loves us, God knows us, and God cares for us, cares for us here in Beverly, in the North Shore, in Massachusetts, and in faraway countries like Nicaragua. That is worthy of shaking some palm branches and saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Or another way of saying it is woohoo. God's love is always with us. Would you pray with me? Please repeat a prayer. God of grace, thank you for all your love that is always with us. And we are grateful and we are joyful because of your love. And may God's people say, amen and woohoo. Thanks for listening, everybody. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, and it's the 19th chapter, verses 28 to 40. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the text. This is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So I invite you to hear these Palm Sunday words. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of these holy words. I have had a song running through my heart and my soul and my mind these past days and weeks. And actually, maybe you have had a song or two running through your heart and your mind as well in these days. If I'm being honest, I actually have had several songs running continuously through my mind. Uh, not the least of which is Raspberry Beret by Prince because it's become my um, 20 second hand washing song. So if I sing the chorus of it, you know, raspberry beret, ch -ch -ch -ch, the kind you find in a second hand store. You don't need to hear me sing the rest, but you get the point. If I sing that chorus, then I make sure that I wash my hands for a full 20 seconds. And I also have had a lot of songs from the Frozen 2 soundtrack in my head these days because we've watched it 
a lot at my house recently. And leading up to this Palm Sunday service, as I've been working on this service and this sermon, I also had the song, The Palms, the hymn, stuck in my head. I think partially because I listened to it so many times on so many different YouTube channels that people had put it because I was looking for just the right one to send to Kara Constantine, who had graciously agreed to help me in making a Palm Sunday video for our church family that includes many of you. You sent me pictures of yourself with your version of what your palms would be if Jesus were coming down your street today. What would you have gone and gotten um, the way that people in Jesus's time got palms off of the trees that grew near them? But I wanted to send her just the right version to put in the background, and so I kept listening to them all and then found myself walking around uh, just sort of cheerfully singing to myself, or all the way green palms and blossoms gay are strewn this day in festal preparation. You can sing the rest on your own, but it is a catchy tune. But you know, since probably the beginning of this new and uncertain time that we're navigating, of this global crisis with this new coronavirus and the disease that it causes, COVID-19, I have had this other song that's just sort of been in the background for me over and over. In fact, it's not even the whole song. It's just been a snippet of a song by American folk singer Dar Williams. The song is called Family. And the lyrics that I just keep hearing and keep carrying with me are these. Can you fix this? It's a broken heart. It was fine, but it just fell apart. It was mine, but now I give it to you because you can fix it. You know what to do. Can you fix this? It's a broken heart. It was fine, but now it just fell apart. It was mine, but now I give it to you. You can fix it. You know what to do. Can you fix this? It's a broken heart. It was fine, but now it just fell apart. It was mine, but now I give it to you because you can fix it. You know what to do. To me right now, it feels like there couldn't be any more perfect words for our particular moment in time for our Palm Sunday moment as we come before God and as we cry out to Jesus than those. And I think maybe those are words that would have really resonated with those first pilgrims on that first Palm Sunday, those who crowded the streets to see Jesus pass. They labored every day under the yoke of Roman oppression and the corruption of an empire that saw them as small, unimportant, and expendable that wasn't concerned with their health care or their well-being or their needs, and they shouted out in the hope of the liberation that comes in and through the love of God. And we, we yearn to be able to live into the radical, liberating kind of love that Jesus teaches. That's what we're chasing after, right? A love that chooses people over power and love over oppression and justice for the many over empire. Can you fix this? It's a broken heart. It was fine, but it just fell apart. It was mine, but now I give it to you because you can fix it. You know what to do. Jesus, can you fix our broken hearts? Jesus, do you see us standing here in our hopeful yearning? Jesus, we were fine, but now things feel like they've fallen apart. Jesus, you can fix this. You can help us. Hosanna, you know what to do. For the brokenness of all of our hearts, we cry out, just as those first pilgrims gathered on the road into Jerusalem did so many years ago. And of course, those of us today know that Palm Sunday is a remembrance of an occasion 
one of many occasions on which the physical and embodied Jesus showed up, when people poured out their brokenness and their hopes to him. And Palm Sunday is also a remembrance of the day that precipitated the start of a shift, the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life, a turning of the tide of the people from being with him to being against him. It's a day that we have to understand if we want to fully understand Holy Week, this week that begins today, this commemoration of the last week of Jesus' life, to understand how we move from the joys of the hosannas of Palm Sunday to the quiet tenderness and some fear and worry of the Last Supper in the upstairs room on Monday, Thursday, to the horror of Good Friday when Jesus was crucified on the cross like a common criminal, to the still silence and sorrow of Holy Saturday, and even into the joy when the stone is rolled away and the tomb is opened on Easter Sunday. To understand all of that fully, we have to understand this Palm Sunday moment too. And our scripture reading from Luke is one of four accounts of this Palm Sunday moment. That's how pivotal this story is. It appears in every one of the gospels, although with a slightly different emphasis captured in each one, which I believe helps to convey to us something that was most important to that particular author, to that particular gospel writer and storyteller. And in Luke's gospel, what we see time and time and time again is the importance of the people, of the inclusion of everyone, of the bringing in of the people on the margins, of an emphasis on the power of the many over the power of empire. And we see that in Luke's account of the triumphal entry as well. In the scripture reading that I shared with you earlier, we see Jesus and his disciples approaching the city of Jerusalem at a time when the city would have been crowded with other travelers and pilgrims all coming, as Jesus and the disciples were, to celebrate the festival of Passover. And then Jesus stops and he says to his disciples, you need to go into the next village and as you enter it, you will find there a colt, a donkey that has never been ridden untie it and bring it here. And Jesus says, if anyone says to you, why are you untying it? Just tell them the Lord needs it. And so the disciples who are being sent go. And just as Jesus had told them, they find the donkey tied there and they begin to untie it. And just as expected, the owners come out and ask, why are you untying this animal? And they say, the Lord needs it. And then they are able to return to Jesus with the donkey and we're told that they put their own cloaks on the back of the animal and then they help Jesus get on the donkey and together they continue their journey into the city. The disciples on foot and Jesus mounted on the donkey and the crowds ahead of them are singing out with joy and waving their palm branches and crying Hosanna and laying down their own coats and their cloaks in the road in front of Jesus so that his donkey's feet might not touch the muddy and the dirty ground, which was a sign of respect and great honor in that time. And this entire scene is an important one because it tells us something both about Jesus and about the intense hope and longing in the people's hearts for and about him. And it tells us something about how things could end up going so very wrong within a week when everything changed. You see, the people were longing for a mighty conqueror to come and help them overthrow the oppressive Roman Empire that ruled them with little regard for their life or their well-being. And Jesus was coming to conquer, but to conquer through love, to lead in and to and through a new kind of peace. And Jesus riding in on a donkey, this story that we heard in the scripture, Sending the disciples to go find this very specific animal, that tells us a lot about how he wished to convey just that message. You see, in Jesus' time, if a leader or a ruler was coming into another country or land and they wished to overthrow it by use of military force, then they would signify that immediately upon entry by riding in on a mighty stallion, on a war horse. But... If this leader or ruler were coming in peace to another land, 
then they would signify that by riding in on a donkey. And here we see Jesus riding into the city on a donkey. He is not there to overthrow the corrupt systems of power and oppression, the heavy-handed and cruel leadership of Rome with military force. He's not there for that. He is there for something else. Jesus's revolution is not a revolution of might, not a revolution of force. Instead, it is a revolution of love. It's a revolution that breaks apart unjust systems and structures of power and oppression by empowering us all. I want to say that again because I think it's so critical. Jesus's revolution is one that breaks apart unjust systems and structures of power and oppression, and it does it by empowering us all, by empowering the many, by reminding every single person that we are of incredible worth and value and importance to God and in the eyes of God, and that we are worthy of that in the eyes of one another. And Jesus calls us to create communities and governments and religious organizations and structures of power that honor that truth, that do justice to the message of equity and equality of an endlessly loving God. And so Jesus, Jesus reveals this in the way that he enters into the city. He reveals that he's there for a different kind of revolution revolution of peace and of love and the crowds gather and they cry out hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord and they wave their branches and they shout with joy and with hope with hope that the burdens that they are carrying and the brokenness of their hearts born out of oppression and fear and worry they they cry out in the hope that those will be lifted and we know this because hosanna means Save us now. Deliver us. And I think in the moments of the triumphal entry into the city, in the moments of incredible hope and longing, we also can see the seeds of understanding how things then shift in the course of the week. Because what we know is that there was enough already happening that the power brokers of Jesus' time the high priests who were part of a corrupt system where they would abuse the poor and overtax them at the temple, not to mention the Romans themselves who would ruthlessly do anything to maintain power and control of their empire. Those power brokers of the day already had enough information at their disposal to want to see the end of Jesus, to be part of his undoing. And they also knew that the people oppressed and downtrodden and eternally hopeful that something better was coming could be easily manipulated to their own corrupt ends. You see, the people were expecting one type of deliverer. They shout out, save us now, deliver us now. And they are hopeful, they are hopeful that God has sent Jesus into the city ready to lead them in a physical uprising that will overthrow the Romans and restore their independence and restore equity and freedom and justice. And we know with the benefit of thousands of years of hindsight and knowing how the story ends, that Jesus is there to usher in a reign of equity and freedom and justice, just not in the earthly way that was expected in that moment. And so the stage is set for the shift from the hosannas of Palm Sunday to the heartache of Good Friday, right there in these moments of the triumphal entry. But also in this moment, in this Palm Sunday moment, in this triumphal entry moment, we see something else. We see the hope of all that is yet possible. The Pharisees and the leaders are so angry at seeing the people respond so positively to Jesus that they command him, Teacher, tell your disciples to stop. And Jesus says to them, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The message of hope and love and justice and goodness and equity that Jesus brings is so powerful, Jesus is telling them 
that it cannot be contained. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be silenced. It is a message of hope and love and goodness for the whole world. A message so powerful that even if the people's voices were silenced, the very earth itself would shout out for joy. The stones, Jesus said, would shout out. It makes me think about how at Christmas, when we remember and celebrate Jesus' birth, we sing about a joy for the whole world. A joy and a hope so great that heaven and nature will sing. A joy and a hope so great that as people cry out in thanksgiving for it, so too will fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. They will repeat the sounding joy. And here again, in these moments, as Jesus' earthly life is drawing to its conclusion, as we've come full circle from those celebratory birthing moments, we see again a hope and a joy so great, a message of love so profound, that even the rocks and the stones will sing. But what does it mean to carry forward with a joy and a hope so great that the earth will resound with it, in moments like this, in moments like ours, in times of uncertainty, testing, separation, loss. What does it mean for us now to shout out Hosanna in these difficult and uncertain days? In days when we can't be together physically as those pilgrims in the city of Jerusalem were. They were gathered together sharing in their excitement, gathered on the streets. And we, for these times, for these moments, we have to be content to be connected at heart and not in body. And what does it mean to shout out Hosanna in these days when we can't gather together to worship in person or gather around the table to share a meal or tenderly gather to wash one another's hands at the Monday Thursday service? What does it mean to shout Hosanna in these moments? Can the joy and the hope still resound from all the earth and from us on this Palm Sunday, on this 2020 Palm Sunday? Or will we give in to the temptation to slip past the recognition of this important moment, caught up in our seemingly endless Good Friday of loss and death and sorrow, or sealed up in the quiet of our houses in the tomb quiet streets of our never ending Holy Saturday. The truth is, the hopeful expectation and the longing to be delivered that we see in the story of that first Palm Sunday, in the story of the triumphal entry, those things are with us even now. And we, like those who crowded the streets in Jesus' time, we are calling out in hope. And we, like those in the crowd, we are broken with sorrow at our circumstances, the circumstances of our moment in time. And we, like them, are racked by news of our losses. We, like those in the crowd, are looking. We're looking for the light breaking through. And we, like those in the crowd, we see it. We see that light breaking through in Jesus. We, like them, are gathered at heart, shouting in so many ways, save us now, deliver us now, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Deliver us now. Deliver us, Jesus, into remembering who we are and whose we are. Deliver us, Jesus, into recalling the incredible power of love that you came to reveal. Deliver us, Jesus, into the reality that we must work together to save one another, which is always what your story has been about. The message that we are bound up in each other. The message that we are knit together in this world with one another and with God. We are all part of the whole, all part of this living and breathing organism of life, of earth, of being, of the human family and the whole of creation. 
We are not now, and we have never been alone. We are always the crowd, and we always have the power to choose, the power to choose love and joy and hope over the power of anger that leads us to dismissal, or betrayal, or mob violence, turning on Jesus when we do and turning in that moment on our very selves. We have instead the power to choose love, to do love, to be love. And that power has always been with us and within us. From the very first moments that God breathed breath and life into humankind, that's, that's what Jesus' story was always about. Deliver us, Jesus, into remembering that truth. And the power of love, the power to work together, the power to choose life over death, the power to choose people over empire, the power to choose one another over money, the power to choose one another over anything else, and to love one another with a fierce and unending love, that power has always been ours. It's knit right into our hearts. It's knit right into the fabric of the divine creation. And Jesus, your life and your love and your kind of conquering was always and is always about reminding us of that, that we are and have ever been God's partners in the ongoing work of healing the world. And that potential and the joyful expectation that is latent in that. That's so powerful that the stones themselves cannot be quiet. The stones themselves cry out and sing. The American author Albert Pine once wrote, What we do for ourselves dies with us. What we do for others and the world remains and is immortal. What we do for ourselves dies with us, but what we do for others and for the world remains, and that is our immortality, those acts of love. I think about so many acts of love and the healing of hearts that I've seen even in these difficult days. I wonder what stories and acts of love you think of in this moment too, maybe done by you or done by someone else and that's helped to heal your heart. I think about pictures that I've seen of healthcare workers all across our country and all around the world with signs that say, we stay at work for you, you stay home for us. A message reminding us that we are knit together in this and that our mutual shared love and service can carry us forward. I think about stories of children in countries all around the world and right here in our own community in Beverly, putting up pictures and messages and signs of thanks for essential workers and first responders and healthcare workers and signs of hope to inspire those who are walking solitary in the streets or watching from our own windows. I think about right here in our own First Baptist family, volunteers coming to serve community meals, to go style community meals now because of our current moment in time for those who most need them, giving of themselves to ensure that people in our community are fed. I think about the image of an elderly man in Morristown, New Jersey, who returned to the emergency room where his wife was taken when she was suffering from COVID and holding up a cardboard sign outside the window saying, thank you for saving my wife's life. I love you all. I think about so many stories and moments, large and small, when the brokenness that we feel can be healed just a little by the love of each other by living into the kind of love and service that Jesus came to live and teach. Those things, those things live on and that is our immortality. The Palm Sunday moment is indeed a precipitous one. We know 
with thousands of years of hindsight, that the crowds that shouted out in joy when they saw Jesus coming will tragically turn on him this week, born out of a moment of human misunderstanding, but also out of their own deep sorrow and hurt and disappointment and fear, born out of their very humanness. And we understand that because we teeter at that place ourselves every day. It's only human to do so. We teeter between our desire to love the world with an unending and expansive and all-encompassing love or to despair in the momentary hopelessness of this time and turn inward. Or worse, to turn on each other, looking for who to blame for the spread of this virus, looking for those to whom we can direct our anger and our ire. It's okay to feel angry in these moments, but not to turn on each other. It's okay to feel grief, both grief for that which we have lost and even anticipatory grief for the losses that we fear. It's okay in these moments to feel confused and sad. It's okay to feel tired and weary. It's okay to feel whatever it is that we feel. But I think the message of Palm Sunday and of Jesus' incredible and unending love, of God's incredible and unending love, is that even in those moments, even in the mix of all our human emotion, even in the brokenness of our hearts, love can break through. And even in these times, we are powerful beyond measure. Even in the hurts of our hearts, love can persist and love can prevail. And the acts of love and the moments of connection now and in the days and the weeks to come, those, those are our immortality. Deliver us, Jesus into remembering that powerful truth. The acts of love that unite us, those are our immortality. Can you fix this? It's a broken heart. It was fine, but it just fell apart. It was mine, but now I give it to you because you can fix it. You know what to do. On this Palm Sunday and into our journey into Holy Week and beyond, we have the opportunity to tenderly and lovingly hold one another's broken hearts. To hold one another's broken hearts. To offer the love and the healing within us just as we reach out in our own need and accept the love and the healing of others. And that shared love, that is our immortality. That's what Jesus' message was always about, that love is greater and love lives on. And that is a good news, so great, that even the rocks and the stones will sing of it. Amen.
had the opportunity to see a virtual Palm Sunday procession, a waving of palms of our church family that was compiled thanks to the help of many of you and thanks to Kara Constantine. And if you were not able to get a picture in of you or your family waving or showing us what you would use for palms in this particular moment in time, if Jesus appeared and came down your street right now, what would you grab in your home or your yard to celebrate and to show your joy and your hopeful expectation? If you didn't have a chance to send in a picture yet, we would still love to see them. And you can take a picture and you can email it to us at the church. You can email it to jflowers at fbcbeverly.org. Uh, or post them to our Facebook page, First Baptist Church in Beverly, and we would be overjoyed to continue to see faces uh, from our church family come in. So you just got to see and hear uh, the palms, and uh, that is a, a traditional way for us to close our Palm Sunday service. And so if you have, if you have something in your home, if you have the uh, palms that you sent a picture of or something else, that makes you feel celebratory and joyful, I encourage you to grab that now, whether it's a flower or a, a branch or a scarf um, or just just yourself and your, and your singing voice. Um, but as we hear our music director, Esther Chang, play our traditional closing hymn, The Palms, I invite you to sing out and to shout with joy, to wave your palms now as together we are joined in this special tradition. service of worship has ended. Our service to the world now begins. As we enter into this holy week, this journey that we are about to embark on on this Palm Sunday, we are mindful that just as Lent has been a unique and different experience, a different kind of wilderness experience 
this year, so too will our Holy Week experience be different this year. It won't be the traditions that we're used to, and yet the wonder and the hope is that Easter comes. God is risen. Love will be loose in the world, no matter what. And so as you move through this holy week, through this holy time, I invite you and I invite us all together to look for and to consider the ways that the story of God's people is yet being written. We're writing it right now in partnership with God. Where are the spaces and the places that you see and encounter God in this most holy week? May you be at peace today and all days. Amen.